All right, welcome tonight. It's good to see you at First Baptist Church of Charleston, Arkansas. Welcome to those who are watching online. We're pleased that you're with us too. If you have your Bible, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. The Sermon on the Mount begins in the fifth chapter of Matthew. We'll begin in verse 1. Have you found it? All right, put your hand right there. Don't lose it. Turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Put your hand right there. Don't lose it. Go back to Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. The he is Jesus. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Keep your hand right there. Go to Luke chapter 6. Verse 17. That he is Jesus. He went down with them and stood on a level place. He's not on a mountain. He's on a plain. He went down with them, stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples were there. And a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Similar but different. Two different sermons. Two different occasions. Two different crowds. Similar teaching in both sermons, but they were different. Jesus went from town to town to town to town. He did not memorize one sermon and preach it over and over and over again. He modeled his sermon for the needs of the crowd. It changed a little bit everywhere he went, but he always had the truth. But he gave it in more than one form, didn't he? So when you study the Sermon on the Mount, it's really good to also study the Sermon on the Plain, which we will not have time to do this week. So you have to do that on your own. The Sermon on the Mount covers three chapters. The Sermon on the Plain covers less than one chapter. And there are significant differences in the two. For example, go back to Matthew chapter 5, and you find there are eight Beatitudes. Four of them that group, and four more that group. But when you look at the Sermon on the Plain, there are only four Beatitudes that are given. They're all included in the eight that are here, but four of them are not included in the Sermon on the Plain. However, in the Sermon on the Plain, you get four Beatitudes, but you get four woes. That's the opposite of a blessing. It's like a cursing. So you have four blessings, Beatitudes, and four woes over in the Sermon on the Plain. There are no woes in the Sermon on the Mount. So there are going to be similarities, but there's going to be differences. And I want you to be aware of those two sermons. Some people try to say they're the same sermon. They are not the same sermon. They're two different sermons. All right, back in Matthew chapter 5. When he saw the crowds, he went on the mountainside. He sat down. By the way, in those days, when teachers taught, they normally did not stand. They normally sat. And the crowds got so big for Jesus at times that he would find a cove by the Sea of Galilee where the people could make a horseshoe around him and then he would get a small boat and sit out in the middle of the cove and sit in the boat while he taught. Here he's on dry land. 
So his disciples came to him and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now there's a common denominator with those four beatitudes. By the way, what does the word beatitude mean? It means exactly what it says. You are to be with this attitude. This is the way you're to have an attitude. Be like this. Now, notice they all begin with blessed. When God blesses us, he reaches down into our lives with his mercy and his grace, and he does something good in our lives. He blesses us. When we bless God, how do we bless God? (laughs) We can't bless God the way God blesses us. The way we bless God is we praise him. When God blesses us, he's not praising us. He's doing something good in our lives we don't deserve. When we bless God, we're glorifying him. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they'll be comforted. Notice with each one of these, there is a blessing. If you're poor in spirit, your blessing is you own the kingdom of heaven. You're part of the kingdom of heaven. If you mourn, your blessing is you'll be comforted. If you're meek, your blessing is you'll inherit the earth. Wait a minute. Look at number 10, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Does that sound familiar? Look back at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So which group gets the kingdom of heaven? Do the poor in spirit get the kingdom of heaven, or do the persecuted get the kingdom of heaven? Both. In biblical studies, this is called an inclusio. It's where we get the word included. It's like a parenthesis or a bracket. When you see theirs is the kingdom of heaven in verse 3 and theirs is the kingdom of heaven in verse 10, it's like putting a bracket around verses 3 through 10 and it says here are the blessings that come to God's people. Because here are the blessings for those who come in the kingdom of God. So there's not eight different groups of people here There's one group of people. This is a description of what people should look like in the kingdom of God. The first four focus on our needs. The last four focus on our deeds. So look again at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Over in Luke 6, it just said, blessed are the poor. There's a difference between being financially poor and being poor in spirit. However, many people who are financially poor are also poor in spirit. What's this talking about? Why is it such a blessing to be poor? Over in the book of James, it says it this way, God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. It's easier for a poor man to have faith in God than for a rich man. So Jesus said it's really hard for a rich man. It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And Peter says, well, what rich man could be saved? He said, with God, that's possible. All things are possible with God, and rich people can be saved too. But it's easier for poor people to be saved than for rich people to be saved. Would you agree with that? And the simple reason is this. The rich person doesn't rely on God in his hard times. He relies on his or her money. And if you trust your money to 
fix everything, then you're not relying on God. But the poor person doesn't have the money to rely upon God, so on, on, doesn't have the money to rely upon himself, so he has to rely on God. It might be blessed that you're not rich. If you were a rich person, would you have come to know the Lord? A lot of rich people don't. Did you know in the days of early Baptist in this nation that the bulk of the members of the churches were poor people? But because Christianity teaches such a good work ethic, over the years, the poor people got saved, learned to work with their hands, and they built themselves up and moved up. And now the majority of people in Baptist churches are not poor people. Sometimes we make a mistake in overlooking the poor people in our communities. You see, God wants poor people to be saved just like he wants wealthy people to be saved, just like he wants middle class people to be saved. He wants all kinds of people to be in a church. And the fact that a person makes money or doesn't make money should not make a difference when it comes to belonging in the body of Christ. So in Luke 6, he says, blessed are the poor. But here he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? A person who's poor in spirit is a person that maybe has had a hard time in life and they get discouraged. You ever been there? A person who's poor in spirit also is a person who's not lifted up in pride. You don't have a haughty spirit. You don't have a prideful spirit. You don't have a better than thou spirit. You don't have a rebellious spirit that says, I can do it myself, leave me alone. A person who's poor in spirit has had enough hard times in life that they realize, I can't make it without help. I need help. And I want you to know this. You will never, ever receive Jesus Christ if you don't come to a place in your life that you realize that you are spiritually bankrupt without Christ, that you are a sinner who is poor and needy. We sing that in our hymns. Come ye sinners poor and needy. We sing those words, don't we? So before a person can enter the kingdom of God, they've got to get over themselves and they have to realize their need for Christ. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Lord, I need you. I cannot make myself right with you. There's nothing I can do to earn my own salvation. I need you. Poor in spirit. Secondly, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. By the way, if you want to write down a reference to that, Isaiah 57, 15 is a great verse for that. I am the high and holy God. I live in a high and holy place, but also with a contrite and lowly in spirit. God loves to draw near to people who are humbled in their hearts. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. You have to become poor in spirit to receive Christ. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There are people who seemingly never have problems in life. Ever been around any of those people? They've always got good health. They've always got money. They've always got a good job. They've always got it all. It looks like outwardly, doesn't it? 
and they don't realize their need for God. But sooner or later, it'll happen to them too. Sooner or later, the times come in life where you can't stop the bad from happening. And it will take away some people you love. You'll take them on to heaven. And it hurts. And there's something so terribly wrong about a mother or dad that lose a child, isn't there? It's just not the way it's supposed to be. And then if you live long enough, you're going to get some kind of disease. Some people get those diseases really early in life. Some of us don't get them until later on in life, but we all get them. It's a matter of time. And these bodies wear out, don't they? They just wear out. Like an old car. You think that car will run forever, but it won't. That car runs long enough, it gets where you can't buy parts. <laughs> if your body lives long enough, the parts wear out, don't they? We try to replace them, and they help for a while. Blessed are those that mourn. Have you ever been cheated out of money? Has anyone ever stolen things out of your house? Yeah. And we mourn. Do you ever have a dream you wanted to accomplish in life that you didn't get to? And we have regrets. Blessed are those that mourn. You see, God knows when people hurt. In Luke chapter 6, he says it this way. Those who never mourn will mourn in the judgment. And those who mourn here on earth will rejoice in the judgment. God has a way of turning that around, doesn't he? But it's a special way here. Just like the first one, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, means you have to realize you're spiritually bankrupt. Now you have to realize you're a sinner and you have to be sorry enough for your sin to repent. Have you ever seen someone that when they repented and trusted Christ, they came to the altar weeping, as they came to the altar. I've seen that many times. And they're weeping tears of repentance. They're weeping tears of sorrow. When you accept Christ, you realize I'm spiritually bankrupt, I can't save myself. And then when you realize how great your sin are, is you go to the Lord in repentance. Some people don't weep but they still repent. They still have godly sorrow. But many people, when they get godly sorrow, they weep and they mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. God loves to comfort people that are hurting. Blessed are the meek. Didn't say blessed are the weak. It said blessed are the meek. What's the difference in being weak and being meek. Well, let me give you the Greek answer, and then let me give you the Hebrew answer. In Greek, the great illustration that Bible teachers use over and over again is a wild stallion. A wild stallion is of no real use until someone can break that stallion where they can put a bridle on him and they can put a saddle on him, and they can ride him. Then that wild stallion becomes something of value, doesn't he? But he has to be broken. He has to be able to be ridden. Is a stallion who's been broken, is that stallion weak? No. That stallion is now under control of his master. In the Jewish illustration of meekness, they didn't use the stallion. 
they used an ox. Are oxes weak? No, they're huge animals. They're extremely strong. They have a different setup. Instead of the saddle, they have a yoke. And Jesus was a carpenter. One of the jobs of carpenters was to make the wooden yoke for each individual ox. And so they had to measure the shoulders and the neck size of the ox. They had to know where his muscles were when he pulled. And they would build that yoke where it would fit that specific ox. And they would smooth out the edges so that when he pulled, the wood would not cut into him so he could pull a heavy load without it hurting him. Did the ox become weak when the yoke was on his shoulders? No, he's strong as ever, but now he can do work for his master. And meekness is simply this. Meekness is giving control to God so God can take all that you were created to be and make you what you were created for. So you can start doing the work God wants you to with your life. You become submissive to the will of the master. And you pull or you carry like the stallion. In the Bible, there are two men who are described as meek. The first man was known for killing a man with his bare hands. He was known for his temper because he broke the stones of the commandment up on Mount Sinai. And another occasion, when God told him to speak to the rod and bring the water out instead of speaking, he took his rod and he slammed it against the rock. He had a temper, didn't he? Was Moses a weak leader? No. He was a strong leader. But Moses learned to humble himself under the hand of God so God could use him for his purpose. The other man said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. That's Jesus. Jesus said, I'm meek. What does that mean? Is he weak? <laughs> There's no one stronger than Jesus. He's stronger than the strong man. He binds Satan and takes away souls from Satan every time a person's saved. But is Jesus a bully? No. Jesus is submissive to the Father's will. Not my will, but thine be done. So when a person comes to know Christ, they have to realize they're spiritually bankrupt, and they have to repent of their sins, have that godly sorrow for their sin that causes them to grieve over their sin, and then they have to present themselves to God and say, God, from this day on, you're my Lord, you're my Savior. I'll take your yoke and I'll follow Jesus. I'll be your stallion. You can ride me where you want me to go. I won't toot my own horn. I'll bugle for you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Do you ever know somebody's been wronged and they don't get justice? Do you ever seen someone lose a loved one to murder and the murderer go free or not be found? And they long for that justice? Well, that side's true, but here's another side. Here's the spiritual side. You cannot make yourself right with God. 
But God made Christ to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And when a Christian hungers for righteousness, that person's hungering and saying, Lord, I need you to be my Savior because I can't make myself right with the Father. I need your righteousness. I hunger and I thirst for that. And a Christian ought to be someone who says, I want to treat my neighbor right. And Lord, if I've treated them wrong, help me to do what's right to restore that relationship. And a Christian ought to be someone who cares about people who are mistreated, about people who are abused, about people that are stepped on in life. We ought to be the defenders of the innocent. We ought to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, don't you hunger for a world in which there's no more sin and there's no more death, no more sadness, no more Satan? Don't you hunger for a time when Jesus will reign and there's no more pain and suffering? We're hungering for righteousness. So, The first four deal with our needs spiritually. We all need to realize our spiritual bankruptcy. We all need to repent of our sins. We all need to put ourselves under the control of God. And we all need to hunger for what only God can give us, true righteousness. When you get to the second four, it changes from needs, N-E-E-D-S, to deeds, D-W-E-D-S. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Well, when we trusted Christ, we received mercy, didn't we? Now that we've received mercy, we need to show mercy to other people. What is mercy? Mercy is reaching down to someone who's in a hole, someone who's in a problem they could never get themselves out of, and reaching down in love and helping them. That's mercy. God does that with us, doesn't he? God's people should be merciful. What is the opposite of mercy? The opposite of mercy is being hard-hearted. A person with a hard heart will not reach down and help someone who cannot help themselves. They don't care. All they care about is themselves, and their hearts are hard. And if you study the Bible, one of the things that angers God the most is having a hard heart. But one of the things that God loves the most is people who have loving hearts and are willing to show mercy. Who have you shown mercy to lately? Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. He's the one that showed mercy. Great example. Blessed are the merciful. And God says this, if you will show mercy, if you will demonstrate mercy in your relationships, God will put more mercy in your life. He'll bless you with more mercy. So blessed are the merciful, they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Jesus said in Matthew 15, the heart is a wicked thing, and it's the heart that defiles us, the thoughts of the heart, the intent of the heart are the things that defile a person, and it's not the things that you eat that defile you, it's the things that come out of your heart and come out of your mouth and out of of your actions that defile us. So Jesus goes to work on our hearts. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us and make our hearts pure. 
And when we Christians let the Lord give us pure hearts, we stop going after the things of the world that are sinful and we start focusing our eyes and our hearts on worshiping the Lord. And when we do that, the Lord reveals himself to us in our spirits. One of these days we're going to see him. 1 John 3 was quoted this morning. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, when we see him, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. And no one can see God without his heart being made pure by Christ. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called sons of God. It's like this. God is here, and people are here separated from God by sin. But Jesus is the great peacemaker, and he died in our place. He bore our sins. So we could come from being enemies of God and we could be at peace with God and have a relationship with God that works the way it's supposed to work. And Christians are to be involved in this with lost people all the time. We're to help people who are over here on this side separated by their sins from God and we should be praying for those people, plowing up the hard hearts with the love of God, planting the seed, watering the seed, reaping the harvest, so that those on the outside can come to know God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the people that help other people find God. But blessed are the peacemakers because sometimes you have a person here and a person here and sin separates them. And blessed are the peacemakers who can help these two come together. That's a good thing too. Sometimes we really need those in churches. Over in the book of Philippians, there were two women who couldn't get along. And Paul calls them by name in Philippians chapter 4. Yodia and Syntyche. He said, you two women work with me in the gospel. Why can't you get along together? So he says, here's what I'm going to do. Syzygus, that's a guy in the church. I take it an older man. He says to Syzygus, you work with these two ladies. You help these two ladies work together. Syzygus, you be the peacemaker between these two. That's a godly thing, isn't it? It's a godly thing. Parents sometimes have to be peacemakers with children, don't we? That happens. Growing up, I never would have dreamed. Our youngest daughter is four years younger than our oldest daughter. And they were just enough years apart that they didn't see eye to eye on anything growing up. But today they're best friends. Isn't that interesting how that can work out? They love each other. The scriptures paid off. The word of God in their lives bore fruit. And now they're friends. They were never really enemies. They were just at each other. You've never seen girls like that, have you? Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called what? Sons of God. Well, I thought you became a son of God if you repent of your sins as many as received him to, gave, to them gave you the power to become sons of God. I thought becoming son of God happened the moment you got saved. It does. You are born again when you get saved. You're adopted into God's family when you get saved. But being called a son of God is something different. This is not referring to the act of salvation. 
This is referring to your character. So, for example, Barnabas in the book of Acts, his real name was Joseph, but he is such an encourager that they nickname him Barnabas. And the B-A-R stands for son of, and the Abbas, encouragement. So his, name, his nickname literally means he's the son of encouragement. Jesus referred to James and John as the sons of thunder because they had quick tempers. That's a picture of their character. In the book of 1 Samuel, Eli has two sons that are wicked. They're ungodly priests. And so they're referred to in the Bible as sons of Belial, which is the filthy name of the devil. Stood for their character. Judas Iscariot's called the son of perdition because he was headed for damnation with his choices. But blessed are the merciful, and Luke says they'll be called sons of God because like God, they have mercy. Here, blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called sons of God because just like God's character is to be a peacemaker, here are believers in the Lord whose character has been shaped, become godly, and they too are peacemakers. So the son of here means you're a chip off the old block. You know what I'm saying? Your character's like your father's. And if your heavenly father's a peacemaker and you're a peacemaker, you're a genuine son of God in that sense. It's a good thing. Well, quickly, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, notice the persecution is very specific. It's not persecution because you sinned. It's not persecution because you made mistakes. It's persecution because you lived righteously the way God wants you to live. You lived in a way to please the Father. You lived in a way that you honored Jesus Christ, and you followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. And if you're persecuted for living righteously, then you are blessed. You say, well, how am I blessed? Well, one way, 1 Peter 4, verse 19 says, If anyone suffers because he's a Christian, the spirit of the glory of Christ rests on him while he suffers. I like that. There's an extra measure of God's spirit that comes on a person's life when they're suffering for righteousness' sake. You may be closer to the Lord when you're suffering for righteousness' sake than any other time this side of heaven. Great example of that is Stephen. Remember it says Stephen, when he was on trial, they looked at him. He's being, he's being punished because he's been righteous, living for Christ. And it says his face was like the face of an angel. An angel's face glows from the presence of God. And so while he's suffering, the Holy Spirit puts some glory from the presence of God on his face and they're all amazed at what he looks like. And so when he dies with that extra glory on him, he can pray for his enemies. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge the way Jesus prayed. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he prays, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit the way Jesus prayed. Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. And he acted just like Jesus in his suffering. Wow. Blessed are you because you see, when a believer suffers for righteousness sake, the Holy Spirit gives them the words they need at that very moment. That's in Luke 12, and that's again in Luke 21. Don't worry what you'll say in that day when they persecute you. The Spirit himself will give you the words. There is a blessing in testimony when you're persecuted. Now, I have to confess, I've been persecuted very little. Have you? Have you been persecuted much? Probably not a whole lot. Some of you may be. 
I've seen some families really persecute family members for accepting Christ. I remember one young lady on the north side of Chicago that preached with Assyrian groups, Middle Eastern groups. She accepted Christ. She was 21 years old. And word got back to her parents before she got home that she had trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And when she got back to that tall building, that tenement building they lived in, way up on the 11th or 12th floor, her suitcases were outside on the sidewalk. And she was never permitted to take part in that family again. She was removed from her earthly family because she accepted Christ. Most of us haven't had that, have we? But it happens. It happens. I'm about to sneeze. Hope I don't. But I'm about to. Quickly. He covers the eight blessings. Now let me say this to you about those eight blessings. God always blesses his children so his children can be a blessing. Let me say that again. Let me say it differently. God does not bless you so the blessing can stop with you. God always blesses us so the blessing can be shared with others. Isn't that true? We are blessed to be a blessing. Now we're going to close up tonight with three strong statements from Christ. They begin in verse 11. Notice in verses 3 through 10 is always, Blessed are those, blessed are those, blessed are those. But when you get to verse 11... He changes to blessed are you. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. I haven't been persecuted very much. But what little bit I've been persecuted, God's going to reward me. What little bit you've been persecuted, he's going to reward you. And if you've been persecuted a lot, you're going to get a lot bigger reward than I get. God rewards his faithful servant. In the same way that persecuted the prophets who were before you. So number one, do not be surprised if sometimes in life you get persecuted. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes you don't get the job promotion and somebody else does, but you deserved it. That happens to Christians, doesn't it? It does. But your reward will be in heaven. You be faithful. Do a good job anyway. Second, you, blessed are you, you are the salt of the earth. Talking about believers. Those who come into God's kingdom, we are to be the salt of the earth. Now what in the world does that mean? Well, this goes back to a time when there was no refrigeration. And the main purpose of salt was not to be in a shaker to make your steak or your salad taste a little better. The main job of salt, and one thing they had in the land of Israel was lots and lots of salt because the Dead Sea had no way of draining out and the salt in the Dead Sea just kept building up and they had mines next to the Dead Sea and they could mine for a million years and not run out of salt. But what's the main purpose of salt? It was take the meat and pack the fresh meat in salt. And that salt 
would keep the meat from rotting. So you could keep that meat in storage till you wanted to eat it. The purpose of the salt was a negative purpose. It was to prevent putrefaction. Have you ever been around some meat that had rotted? How good did it smell? Man, it just make you gag, won't it? It's terrible. I was in, living on the south side of Chicago. One night I forgot and left my garage door up. And some guys sneaked in our house and tore up the bottom floor of our house. I was upstairs asleep, never heard them. And I go down see all the mess, and it took me, my wife and my kids were gone. They were over to see her mom. I was glad they were gone. And so when that happened, I cleaned up the downstairs, but I did not notice they had unplugged our freezer in the garage. And so it was a few weeks before I opened that freezer door. And, oh, that was a terrible smell. It was awful. The salt keeps that from happening. Now, I want you to picture this. Can you picture in your mind the earth as a big round globe? Picture that big round planet as being all meat. Now, we're the salt that God puts on that meat. And what are we supposed to do? We keep the meat from rotting. I want you to know this. It's only when Christians live like Christians. It's only when Christians live righteous, godly, Christ-like lives that we're salt. But when we Christians do this, we prevent our culture from rotting. Why is our culture in America rotting today? There's not enough Christians living out in the open in society being salt. We don't have to be obnoxious to be salt. We can speak the truth in love and be salt. But if we don't live a godly lifestyle, then our culture rots and it stinks. And there's a lot stinking in America right now. Because Christians need to be salt. Jesus says this, you're the salt of the earth, but the salt loses its saltiness. How can it be made salty again? How can salt lose its saltiness? The way that happens is you crumble up the salt and you separate it. And then you put other things around the little particles of salt. You put impurities around the salt. And if you get enough impurities, the salt loses its pungency because there's not enough salt there to make an impact. You know any Christians in America that have become that? They've quit being salt, and their lives have been changed by the culture. Instead of us changing the culture, the culture has changed us, and we've got so many impurities in our lives that the salt can't do anything. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. We need to be salt. We need to negate the unrighteousness that's going on in this world by living godly lives, sharing the gospel with the lost. Verse 14, you're the lie of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, 
Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do you know the world doesn't care what we do inside our churches? What the world really cares about, what we do outside our churches. And if we only let our light shine when we're here together with each other, but we go outside the doors, we leave the outside in darkness and don't let our light shine, then what good are we in this world? The light has to shine in the darkness. We can't hide it behind the walls of the church or the walls of our houses. We have to live publicly, openly, honestly for Christ. And believe me, there are folks out there that will persecute us if we do that. They will. How do you let your light shine? May they see the good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Our light shines when we do good things that bring glory to God. Our lights are not shining when we do good things to bring glory to us. That's not light. Light is doing godly things and giving God the praise, the glory, causing others to praise God. Jesus is very practical, isn't he? So we're blessed to be a blessing. And we have four needs, Beatitudes, that deal with how we come into his kingdom. We have to realize our need for spiritual bankruptcy. Our need to weep over our sins. Our need to come under his control our need to learn to hunger for godly things instead of ungodly things. And then we have four deeds, Beatitudes. Be merciful. Be pure in heart. Be a peacemaker. Don't be afraid to be persecuted. And you are blessed when you're persecuted and you're blessed when you're salt and you're blessed when you're light you're blessed when you're persecuted and you're a blessing when you're salt and you're a blessing when you're light we are blessed to be blessed Christianity is very basic on his truths, isn't it? These verses are still for us today. We need these verses. All right, let's pray. Father, it's good to be in your house. I pray, Father, that you would humble our hearts. Help us to realize how much we need you. Help us, Lord, to keep repenting when we sin. We don't repent just the day we get saved. We need to repent as we sin. And Father, we need to come under your control, your lordship, and be strong for you. Not because we're strong, but because you're strong. And you can strengthen us. Father, help us to love what you love. Help us to hate what you hate. Help us to choose to hunger for things that are righteous. Father, let the world find believers who let our light shine, believers that are salt, believers that are unafraid to be persecuted, you were unafraid to be persecuted for us, Lord. Help us to be like you. Bless us as we study this sermon this week. Open our eyes spiritually. Help us to see the truths. But Lord, help us not just see them. 
Lord, help us to learn them and obey them and put them into our daily lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.